Доброго ранку. Ми дуже раді, що незважаючи на ранішній час, як у суботу, всі бажаючі долучитися до такого інтелектуального вікенду разом з нами. Ми вітаємо вас, М17 радий бачити всіх. Ми надзвичайно щасливі те, що ми проводимо таку подію, яка об'єднує багатьох людей з усього світу. І сьогодні ми святкуємо День народження Малевича. Це буде цікавий, дуже інтенсивний по програмі день. Залишайтеся з нами. І е, я передаю слово кураторці цього проєкту, Тані Філевській, е, якій ми так само вдячні за таку чудову подію. І, Таня, програма. Дякую. Доброго дня. Дійсно, сьогодні в нас День Малевича, і всі сьогоднішні, фактично всі сьогоднішні доповіді будуть присвячені саме Малевичу. Але також логічно в цьому контексті буде і наша розмова про мапу українського авангарду, власне, як на цій мапі, власне, де пролягли шляхи Малевича на цій мапі. Отже, зараз в нас буде лекція Шен Шєна, присвячена новим знахідкам про Малевича і Татліна в їхнім взаємозв'язкам і стосункам в різні періоди, заснована на нових знахідках архіву Харджиєва. Після того пані Віта Сусак все ж таки дасть нам відповідь на те питання, чий же Малевич, ми нарешті дізнаємось, чий він. І після того в нас буде великий і дуже розлогий такий круглий стіл. Ми на нього відвели достатньо часу, дві години. І поговоримо про те взагалі, яка, як виглядає мапа українського авангарду, звідки в нас починається на сході-заході, на півночі-півдні. Поговоримо, намагаємося, спробуємо зрозуміти, наскільки вона поєднувана та в єдину мапу чи ні, чи це все ж таки різні мапи авангардів в Україні. Ну, поговоримо про це. І після того в нас буде ще одна велика лекція розлога пана Мирослава Шкандрія про відкриття власне Малевича на Заході. І на завершення буде прем'єрний показ фільму Малевич документального, який буде супроводжуватись обговоренням. Тобто супернасичена програма, суперцікава. Марафон справжній, та марафон Малевича. Але перш ніж ми перейдемо до програми, мені дуже-дуже хочеться розповісти, власне, про те, де народився Малевич. Та? Тому що саме сьогодні, ну, день народження все ж таки не, незвичайний день. Хочеться згадати, власне, ту мить і подумати про те, як це було. Та? І от, власне, 140 років тому, рівно в цей день, в цьому місці народився Казимир Малевич. Це сталося буквально в кількох кварталах звідси. Тобто ми з вами дуже близькі, власне, географічно до тієї адреси, до тієї точки на мапі. Але е, це на момент 1879 року був зовсім не центр Києва, великого міста. Це була окраїна. Це була е, така нова вулиця, яка от щойно постала. Цей район почав розбудовуватись десь якраз в середині 19 століття. І от вулиця Жилянська, власне, на якій Малевич народився, е, побудована була буквально за кілька років, коли переселяли людей з Печерська, де будувалась Печерська фортеця, і на всіх людей, які жили, власне, в тому районі Печерської фортеці, відселили сюди. І спеціально для цього збудували цілий район, кілька вулиць. Якщо ви подивитесь на мапу Києва, то це такі рівно розбудовані під 90 градусів кути вулиці. І це, власне, була така забудова запланована і дуже швидко в один час вона постала. І, власне, вулиця Жилянська була останньою. За нею вже починалась Пасовиська. Це були Пасовиська, Києво-Печерської лаври. Власне, там були величезні такі ангари, де жила худоба, її випасали, і, власне, вже пролягала залізниця, і це вже було за містом, так? далеко за містом. І ось навіть існує фотографія, власне, приблизно десь середини 70-х років, 
за міста, та, ми бачимо на передньому плані залізницю, поле, і починається Київ. І, власне, ось на передньому плані один з дворів, це, власне, будинок Марії Оржиховської, однієї з старших сестер батька Малевича, в будинку якої проживало молоде подружжя, яке за рік до того побралося в Києві. І ми про це знаємо з свідчень, метричної книги Костела Святого Олександра. І через рік у них народився первісток, якого назвали Казимир, який був так само охрещений в Костелі Святого Олександра, про що записано в метричній книзі. Звичайно, в документах немає написано, що от, власне в Марії Оржиховської проживали її брати і сестри, але ці свідчення є в спогадах і... В принципі, за документами, які свідчать про те, де, коли працював, власне, Казимир Малевич і його брат, ми розуміємо, що в цей період, саме наприкінці 70-х, він, не, він ще, напевно, перебував в пошуках роботи і, власне, не маючи іншої адреси, зафіксованої для себе, і маючи сестру, в якої було дві-три будівлі на території її маєтку, які вона не здавала. І ми перевірили, були такі спеціальні книги, де фіксувалося, хто отримував прибуток зі своєї власності, власне. І то е, там зафіксовано чітко, що Марія Оржиховська, вона мала тільки невеличку крамничку, яка виходила на фасад, на фасад вулиці Жилянської. В той час, як на садибі, в неї було в різний час від двох до чотирьох житлових будівель. Очевидно, що ці житлові будівлі, якщо вони не здавали, призначались для її потреб, потреб сім'ї. І вірогідно, що на території однієї з цих будівель і жив, жила родина меншого брата Казим... Северина, та Северина Антоновича з його молодою дружиною Людовікою, в яких народився первісток. І це я вам трошки відкрила інтригу вже нашого фільму, який ми будемо говорити, дивитися ввечері. Просто там так детально не розповідаємо ми всі ці пошуки, тому що насправді пошуки всіх цих архівів, які стосувалися адреси Малевича, зайняли кілька місяців, а в фільмі це всього лише там, пів хвилини дуже, дуже чітко, е, такого, розп... е, чіткої історії. Е, та, ну, власне... Це те, що я хотіла вам розповісти та, про, власне, факт народження Малевича. І тільки скажу, що ми, коли відкрили в архіві, це, було, ми, це відкриття сталося, власне, під час зйомок. Тобто ми приїхали на зйомки для того, щоб знайти підтвердження адреси на Бульйонській 15. Та? Це адреса, яку вказала Вікторія. І от коли мені винесли всі ці книги, я почала шукати цю Бульйонську. На цій Бульйонській ні разу не згадується Марія Оржиховська. Потім я почала шукати за прізвищем. І от на прізвищ Ще Марія Жиховська, я знайшла купу матеріалів. Це були плани перебудови садиби, це були адресні книги, де вказана була її адреса. І, власне, от це все відбувалося під час зйомок прямо в кадрі. Це, цей момент зафіксований. І ми відразу з архіву поїхали на Жилянську. Там ми, ну, так, орієнтовно ми зорі... ще не... на той момент у нас не було картографічної звірки, яку ми пізніше провели, наклавши старі карти на нові і точно встановили місце знаходження садиби. А на той момент ми лише уявно, приблизно собі уявляли значить, це розташування. Ми поїхали, почали ходити навколо, зайшли на територію Києвенерго, яке, власне, розташовується на частині цієї садиби, почали просто в людей розпитувати, які там працюють. І нам пощастило, там були такі старожили, які працюють уже по понад 20 років, здається, в цьому Києвенергію, вони почали розповідати нам щось нещодавно. Тут засипали льох 19 століття. І ви ще можете побачити, де він був, тому що там, значить, така залишилась ну, форма, власне, входу. І що там ще знаходили якісь речі. І коли ремонтували е, гру, е, фундаменти, власне, основної будівлі Києвенерго, то там викопували різне, каже, і золоті е, речі, предмети, і якісь там елементи побуту, посуд і все таке. Ну, але, каже, ви вже його нічого не знайдете зараз. Так що дещо, можливо, в Києві в когось в приватних колекціях є, можливо, якісь особисті речі родини Оржиховських. Ми не знаємо. А, так. Да, да, зараз. Так що Малевич нам дає відповіді, дає ще більше запитань, так що цікаво з ним бути. А я б хотіла сказати, до речі, якраз і куратори, і колекціонери наші казали, як же так, ви святкуєте день народження Малевича, і у вас немає жодної роботи Малевича. І от, до речі, вчора до нас підійшов, показав свою 
цікаву роботу. Я проконсультувала з усіма автопортрет Малевича, який ми сьогодні чекаємо. Він був написаний за три роки до смерті, здається, так? Так, так. У нас буде книга якраз з усіма експертами, які бачили цю роботу і так далі. Я думаю, що це буде надзвичайно цікаво на неї поглянути сьогодні. І вона мусить бути тут. Так що побачимо. Ну, інтенсивна програма. І, Таня, запрошуємо нашого спікера, так? Так, і запрошую Шенга для, власне, початку нашої програми. Передаю. Спасибо большое. Я зроблю це в англійській, як я сорі сказати, що я не говорю українською. I do speak a bit Russian, though, um, so if there are questions later on, maybe, um, uh, I would be glad to answer them in Russian as well. I will hope to see that this will work. Yes. Well, maybe this one first. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a short presentation for you today um, uh, on the ever interesting topic of the rivalry between Malevich and Tatlin, um, where I can add some uh, interesting details uh, that maybe will shed a new light on at least part of that rivalry that was so um, determining and so uh, important for the development of the avant-garde and played both a positive and a negative role, I think, in, um, uh, in the development and the fate of the um, avant-garde in the Russian Empire and in uh, the Soviet Union. The intense personal and professional rivalry between Vladimir Tatlin and Kazimir Malievich is one of the crucial structuring narratives in the historiography of the avant-garde in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Scholars of great reputation, such as Charlotte Douglas, Kristina Loder, who was yesterday with us, and Anatoly Strigalyov, among others, have written extensively on the subject, exploring the theoretical and also micro and macro political aspects of the conflict in great detail. Um, in that particular um, uh, composition, uh, it is, if I define it very simply, mostly said that um, Malevich would represent heaven, the, the, the cosmic aspect of reality, and Tatlin, uh, the material aspect of reality. Um, that is a, a, an extreme a uh, form of, uh, of making it simpler than it is, but um, that would be the, the, the easy way to explain it. Um, the foit between the two artists has become part of the folklore of the history of the avant-garde. So it certainly also has become part of a more popular history, I could say. In many books and articles on the subject, the sometimes mind-blowing anecdotes surrounding this history have become welcome distractions from the otherwise rather heavy or even tragic history of the avant-garde in, in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. While their historical factuality, of course, has to be taken with great caution, I am the last who would argue that those anecdotes have no real or only marginal significance for the true understanding of these two artists. Instead, I would like to argue that their void was for them a very public matter, as a part of their public representation and projection of their artistic imagination. The elimination of the distinction between art and life, the negation of artistic professionalism in favor of an artistic manifestation that embodied the whole of life, the simultaneity of the artistic persona and the biographical self, that all has been part of the program of the first generations of avant-garde artists. And it is in many ways reflected in the conflict between Malevich and Tatlin. 
especially Tatlin, was a master in the production of live stories, either by telling partly or wholly fabricated stories about himself to others, or by demonstrating eccentric, enigmatic, if not ludicrous behavior. We only need to remember the variety of stories he spread about his meeting with Picasso in 1914, or for that matter, with the German emperor, Wilhelm II. He um, claimed uh, not only that Wilhelm II saw him at the famous conference where he um, uh, dressed as a Ukrainian um, bandura player, as is well known, a blind Ukrainian bandura player uh, performed at the at a, at a, um, at the Boers there, um, but that he also um, performed at the palace of uh, Wilhelm II as part of a whole orchestra of, of balalaika players where he, with his bandura, would then play solo. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is obviously a completely fabricated story. Um, he convinced his students, also one of these wonderful um, uh, stories, that he had been a snake charmer in Egypt. And he convinced Daniel Harms, the, the wonderful writer and supporter of the avant-garde, that he could levitate 15 centimeters above the ground uh, by the pure force of his concentration, as Harms excitedly wrote to his friend Boris Simeonov. And Harms wrote that Tatlin would lay on the ground and then by the pure force of his um, concentration would come up from the floor 15 centimeters. Harms was not um, um, uh, at such a performance, but uh, he believed it when Tatlin told this to him. So it just uh, was part of the convincing uh, nature of his storytelling. But as said, also, his behavior was part of this deliberate manifestation of the artistic persona. We only need to bring to mind the memoirs of Valentin Kurdov, an artist from Leningrad who in the 1920s belonged to Tatlin's entourage at Ginchuk, who remembered that Tatlin's students were given axes when Malevich came too close to Tatlin's studio in order to, and I quote, guard the secret of the studio. Good of many years later, remembered that this behavior was, and I quote, just a lot of fun, delightfully boisterous, uh, a game, a rowdy joke, end of quotation. I think um, Kurdov's understanding of this behavior as a game or as a rowdy joke is very much to the point and accentuates the, the public, playful, even theatrical character of the rivalry which consequently, and again deliberately, became part of the manifestation of Tatlin's artistic persona. Um, there are many more um, wonderful stories about Tatlin's behavior, and especially about his, uh, his enormous secrecy uh, towards Malevich. Um, it's well known that already uh, in 1914 he did not want, or maybe 1915, he did not want that Malevich came too close to his studio and he closed all the window curtains always to make sure that even if uh, Malevich would walk on the other side of the road he could not look inside uh, in his studio. Um, although I also have to add that this particular weird secrecy was not confined to Malevich alone. It uh, uh, expanded to uh, all kinds of other people, including those who were very friendly uh, to Tatlin. For example, uh, even in the, the 30s, he once, uh, um, uh, when Anna Akhmatova visited him and wanted to visit his studio, he uh, blocked her entrance into his studio. And that while, of course, Akhmatova was the, the, the friend, dear friend of Nikolai Punin, who was uh, Tatlin's most important supporter. So even Akhmatova was not allowed into the studio at a certain moment. And she was, of course, uh, um, extremely, um, uh, well, 
unhappy with that event. Um, um, uh, being a very proud woman, of course. Um, uh, well, it is clear that Tatlin theatricalized and publicized his rivalry with Malevich. There was a very serious aspect to it as well. As Anatoly Strigalyov noted several times, Tatlin and Malevich were involved in a bitter fight for the leadership of the avant-garde. A fight that not only implied hierarchy and reputation, but also the access to rare resources, the access to the rare media platforms, to teaching positions, to talented students, and in the main end maybe to the question of survival and contingency as well. The enormous suspiciousness that especially Tatlin exposed was part of his troublesome, maybe even traumatized psychological constitution, but was also an effect, um, was also an effect um, of the transition from an understanding of art that was based um, on mastery and skill to an understanding of art that was based more and more on conceptuality. As concepts can be adopted, taken over, appropriated, stolen maybe, as Tatin would say, while mastery can only be imitated at best, it is understandable that artists guarded their ideas with more than average zeal. Great suspiciousness was uh, not the attribute of Tatlin alone. Malevich also could end his letters to his co-conspirators with a heartfelt, and I quote, tear up this letter after you've read it. And one of these letters to Matushin is actually saved, but it is the only one. And of course, we do not know how many letters he wrote ending with this quotation, tear up this letter, um, because they have been destroyed, if there were many. In this presentation, I would like to touch upon a few of those instances when the rivalry between the two great artists had a serious foundation, based, as said before, on access to resources, media platforms, and job positions. I would like to do so because recently, in the first publication of materials from the Khajev collection by Ergali, some new and very relevant information has come to light that clarifies the growing, almost aggressive conflict between Malevich and Tatlin in the early 20s, especially when Malevich tried to unify all avant-gardists under the aegis of Unovis, and of course, under his, Malevich's leadership. There are a few more sources that have come to the fore recently, which shed a new light on the subject of the malevich tatlin conflict. And to conclude, the conflict had an immediate effect on their relationship with the Kiev Art Institute, on which they both, both taught in the second half of the 20s. The conflict between Malevich and Tatlin originated, of course, as is many times recorded, during the one and a half year or so leading up to the 010 exhibition. In 1913 and 1914, the two artists more or less regularly worked together in Tatlin's studio, which at the time was maybe the most important gathering ground and laboratory for radical artists. There is a nowadays well-known photograph where Tatlin is seen on a visit to Nemchinovka. It's this well-known photograph, um, which emerged from uh, Tatlin's heritage. Tatlin hid this photograph and denied that the picture ever was made. He later admitted that he visited Nemchinovka, but convinced his students that he, clothed and all, so with his clothes on, sprung in the small pool there when Malevich pulled out a camera to avoid at all costs to be photographed together with the horrible Kazimir. The only existing print of that photo and of that event instead Tatlin preserved for the rest of his life, which is strange duplicity. And the small portrait that Tatlin made from Malevich is maybe a bit ironic 
But it is also an interesting and dynamic depiction of uh, Malevich's persona, and certainly not the expression of extremely unfriendly relationship, I would say. And why not, of course? Tatlin and Malevich shared a common interest in radical art. They shared a part of their background. Both grew up in Ukraine. They could speak, speak Ukrainian and share the experience of poverty and of being marginalized artists. But the next one and a half year would be groundbreaking for the avant-gardists. Tatlin would develop his reliefs, later counter-reliefs, that were the first non-painted works of abstract art. Would that mean that's not paintings? They were, of course, painted in a way, but they were um, established from other materials. Uh, breaking out of the two-dimensional closure and destroying thereby one of the most defining categorizing principles of Western art, the division between painting and sculpture. Partly as a reaction to Tatlin's leap forward, a provoked Malevich developed suprematism, the system that actually tried to deepen the two-dimensional experience, tried to build an endless space deep into the canvas, as Elisitsky put it, and confront the viewer with his cosmic self. What happened at that exhibition uh, has this been described many times. Malevich, with his unmatched gift for publicity, uh, attracted all attention with his installation of suprematist's work, and especially, of course, with his black square. And Tatlin's presentation of his corner counter-reliefs at the same exhibition, a form of installation art in a way, that was certainly as outrageous and innovative, was outpaced. Now, I very often recognize with students, for example, or um, with more general uh, lovers of art, that uh, many people even don't even know that Tatlin was as heavy represented at that exhibition as Malevich was. Many people think that it's a solo exhibition or so. Um, while I do not want to repeat that whole history, there are two small aspects of it to which I would like to draw attention. Firstly, the placement of the black square in the corner. Um, which is an inseparable part, of course, of the conceptual unity of the dark work. It is very well possible that Malevich picked up the idea for that positioning in Tatlin's studio, where both Tatlin and some of the other artists um, working there, notably Yubov Papova, were placing their reliefs in the corner. And you can see um, one of the reliefs that Popova made in 1915 on a photograph in the early 20s, so the photograph is made by, by Rochenko then. Uh, the artwork, though, is much older. Um, and it is very well possible that, you, that Popova, uh, already at when she uh, first exhibited that work in uh, Tatin's studio, that it was also already placed in the corner. Uh, I give also uh, a historical photograph of one of Tatlin's uh, corner counter-reliefs, which was uh, also placed uh, in the corner. And I suppose that most of you know these pictures, so um, uh, the idea, of course, is, is important that it, it's the, the placement in, in the corner. Um, secondly, and maybe more in, interesting, interestingly, the use of the paint of the black square. Recent research into the chemical composition of the black paint in the black square reveals that Malevich used politour, French polish, as it is sometimes named, or shellac in Russian, which I think actually comes from the Dutch word schellac, as an ingredient in the black oil paint to achieve a rather dim but velvety effect um, in, the, in the, the, the black oil. As the researchers who found this pointed out, shellac was a very rare component in art paints of the day. And the only other artist who is known to have been experimenting with shellac earlier was Vladimir Tatlin, who used it in some of his early reliefs of the period, apparently to achieve the same velvety effect. It is certainly possible that Malevich appropriated both the aesthetic appearance 
and the conceptual positioning of the black square from Tatlin. Of course, even if we would know that this for certain would be true, it would in no way diminish the achievement of Malevich's artwork. All artists were continuously appropriating ideas from each other. Tatin himself obviously appropriated ideas developed by Picasso and others. But if both uh, suppositions would be true, it would make clear that Tatlin's erratic secrecy was also partly based on real instances in which Malevich took possession of ideas that Tatlin had earlier developed. A new, crucial incident in the development of their growing conflict was linked to Tatlin's development of the Monument for the Third International. First, um, show the famous, maybe the most famous uh, installation picture from the history of the Russian avant-garde with the um, uh, black square in the corner and here once more Popova's uh, positioning and Tatin's positioning in the corner. Um, for that, uh, and I'm now speaking of the uh, Monument to the Third International, for that now world famous work of art, as Tatin liked to proclaim, Narkampros, the People's Commissariat of Enlightenment, in which both he and Malevich were powerful officials at the time, had commissioned him to develop a model. And you see here um, uh, Punin's booklet on the model uh, with um, Tatlin's uh, design um, for the cover. As has been documented and has been reported on by various historians, Malevich then started a new fight, accusing Tatlin of spending far too much money on his vision for the monument, rare funds that, as Malevich argued, could be used for more valuable, more productive projects that would strengthen the ideals of the avant-garde more effectively than by this, as Malevich called it, utilitarian monument. As Malevich then said in his idiosyncratic Russian, and I quote, Tatlin's horizon was barred by steel, end of quote. Malevich subsequently chose to make that fight public. He wrote a blistering polemic against his colleague and fellow artist, which he published in a weekly paper published by the Free State Art Studios, the precursor of Khutemas, mainly meant for students and teachers at that institution. Malevich wrote, and I quote in that article, the idiot Tatlin wants to receive money for a utilitarian monument that reveals no new meaning. Stop with the formation of such burial monuments of obelisks on the living rat platform of our community. End of quote. It was the first time that Malevich aired the dirty laundry of their rivalry on a public platform. David Stierenberg then the head of the Free Art Studios and also a powerful official in Narkompros and, of course, the supporter of the avant-garde within the commissariat, became furious and ordered to destroy the whole edition of the publication with Malevich's polemic. Still, a few copies of the weekly survived and were excitedly passed around. It certainly did not support the position of the avant-gardists, who already in early 1919 had become under fire from traditionalists and populists in the art school and the commissariat, who contested the position of the former futurists in the revolutionary state. This episode, while maybe not extremely well known, has been recorded and commented upon by various historians. While it is clear that Malevich's public action was indeed damaging for the position of the avant-garde, the question remains if he had a point, and if Tatlin indeed used the scant funds at their disposal for his own artistic project, from which obviously he himself would benefit the most. The agreement, the contract between Narkam Pros and Tatlin, in which Tatlin is assigned to develop the model, is preserved in the state archives of the Russian Federation, GARF, and as far as I know has never been published before. That agreement, signed by both Tatlin and Sterenberg,
who acts here as Lunacharsky's representative, stipulates the artistic features of the projected monument and partly its projected purposes. It also reveals how much money Tatlin received as compensation for his works, namely nothing at all. Yes, the agreement clearly states that Tatlin would only receive a compensation of 15,000 rubles only if the monument would be accepted by the government and actually would be built, which of course didn't happen. The sum of 15,000 rubles, by the way, was certainly not high. If, if Nakompros in that period would buy a painting from an artist, what happened frequently then, in order to support the artist uh, that were working for the government, Nakompros would pay sums between 10 and 20,000 rubles uh, for a single painting. Again, his compensation would have been not more than that of a single painting, but even that small compensation he never received. The agreement states that Tatlin would receive reimbursements for the actual costs he had made in order to construct the model, but it stipulates that he should always try to receive materials in kind, in natura, as you could say. And the agreement contains instructions for third parties factories and other suppliers that they should try to meet Tatlin's needs in order for him to complete the model. As Nikolai Punin in his diary noted, um, that Tatlin in the workshop where he created the now world famous model did not have any professional instruments, only old fashioned and simple saws and hammers, we can be sure that the production of the monument of the, to the Third International did almost not cost Narkompros anything at all, only some material. Given that information, knowledge that Malevich had, or could have had, just by asking Stierenberg, his polemic against Tatlin becomes even more outlandish. And it is clear that Tatlin indeed had something to complain about. The last incident we see here, of course, um, so also well-known but beautiful pictures um, of Tatlin uh, working with his um, uh, students and collaborators on uh, uh, the project, the, the model of the, of the monument. Uh, and you see here, which is also, of course, recorded, that they used very simple materials, and certainly not steel and glass. Uh, which was uh, projected, even the, the famous uh, um, uh, glass uh, cubes and volumes uh, were not made of glass at all, but of a kind of uh, paper. You see uh, Sofia dimschitz Tolstaya in the right picture on the left, working on one of these um, uh, volumes. The last incident that I would like to discuss happened only a few months later. Malevich at the time was already in Vitebsk, where he was trying to set up UNOVIS, what in his mind would have to become not only an educational institute, but the new platform on which the whole of the avant-garde should be united. With branches all over the Soviet Union where they could teach, research, develop exhibitions and other projects, obviously under the leadership of Malevich himself. For that idea, Malevich tried to involve Tatlin as well. Because despite, despite all the differences and their conflicts, Malevich still considered Tatlin to be the next great figure in the realm of the new arts, next to himself, of course. To entice Tatlin and his co-workers, the so-called Tatlinisti, uh, Malevich sent his assistant Nina Kogan to Tatlin in Petrograd. Now, it is important to, uh, to know that Kogan had been a former student and champion of Tatin himself, as were other assistants of Malevich, like Yermolayeva. Also, Tatin's students and his collaborator, uh, Mirzon and Shapiro, also both seen uh, on the picture here and on the left, um, uh, yeah, were both originally from Vitebsk as was Tatlin's girlfriend and also part of the Tatlin commander, Sofia Dimschitz, whose family was originally from the region. 
Malevich tried to lure them all to Vitebsk, where the food situation at the moment was far better than in Petrograd. Nina Kogan instructed her dear friend Pyotr Mituric, who also was Tatin's friend, Tatin's friend to already warm up Tatlin to the idea of becoming part of the UNUVIS collective. I have one other picture of the uh, whole commander. So um, it was the idea uh, to not only attract Tatlin, but also um, the whole group of artists surrounding him, and especially, of course, the three people from, um, uh, from the, the, the region, that uh, Sofia Dimšić. Um, uh, I think uh, was also from the regions that she um, said this once to um, uh, uh, some of her uh, uh, of her friends. Of course, she was not really born there, but I think that her family came from there. Uh, Dimshis also was, of course, of Jewish descent. Uh, she later on um, um, uh, was baptized, went over to. Catholicism, um, or uh, to orthodoxy, I think, in order to, 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 to marry Alexei Tolstoy. But after her, um, after she divorced uh, Tolstoy, she uh, went back to Judaism. So it is well possible that she, in a way, tried to hide her, um, her background there. And uh, she also traveled uh, at least two times in the early 20s to, to, to Vitebsk. And here again we see Sofia Dimšić uh, by Matiros Saryan. Uh, let's go back there. I'm going to uh, read out some of the letters um, that Kogan wrote. Hello. Um, these are letters from Kogan to Pyotr Mituric. So, uh, last year, published uh, by Irgali from the Khajak Archive, in which she uh, explained her plans with Tatlin and tried to uh, involve Mituric in um, uh, bringing uh, Tatlin to, uh, to, to Vitebsk. Uh, I will read it in Russian, as I hope you all will understand. Um, uh, Пишите скорее Татлину, she writes uh, in, in August of 1920. Пишите скорее Татлину, чтобы он показал мне памятник, а то не покажет. Вы пишите, что он во многом прав, но в чем именно? So it's already clear here that uh, one way or the other, uh, Tatlin has uh, expressed uh, his complaints to Kogan, maybe through a third party, maybe to uh, Mituric. Но в чем именно? Я его спрошу, да, скажет ли он мне врагу то? Я уверена, что он не знает, как следует, что мы хотим. Матюшин, Малевич's great friend, who is still also in Leningrad, она тоже ничего не знает. Теперь, как быть со съездом? So she wanted to um, organize a, a meeting. Um, говорили вы с Татлиными? So that means Татлин's collaborators, о съезде. Шепшать ли членам, что они члены? So uh, Mituric here also had to already uh, communicate them that they were already members of UNIVIS, apparently before they were asked if they would like to. Next letter. <laughs> In the next letter that she writes, uh, it's early, early September to uh, Mituric, um, she relates uh, how her meeting with Tatlin and how that went. It's a very interesting uh, small part. Bila u Tatlina. Nie pokazal ni jednoj roboty, ni modeli. Uh, the model to the third international, ни учеников работ. Относится так враждебно к Уновису и главное к Азимиру Северинович, Севериновичу, что из ваших слов я даже не заключала. So she had contact before with Mituric. Mituric said already that she shouldn't expect too much from, from Tatlin, that uh, he was враждебно towards them. Um, обвинения, которые он нам предъявил, 
просто лишают возможности отвечать. Формула такая. Все мое. Но если у вас что-то есть, вы взяли это у меня. И вообще нет ничего, кроме меня. Татлина. End of quote. Виновата я во всем. Петр Васильевич, Петр Васильевич Митурич, дайте совет, как теперь успокоить человека. Это в код being tatly. Ваша э, Нина Коган. And then she concludes with an interesting sentence. Но в чем он прав, в том прав. И я это признаю. Um, what exactly, of course, she is referring to is not clear, but I can imagine that it was Tatlin's anger uh, about the, uh, the polemic uh, and the very unjustified attack, attacks by uh, Malevich concerning the monument uh, to the Third International. Um, uh, and to conclude, um, there's of course uh, a whole history still, especially um, when uh, Malevich and Tatin later on were both working at Ginchuk, which I think is the, the high point of their rivalry, but it has been uh, described uh, by many people uh, before. Um, uh, and that, of course, had an enormously negative consequence for the history of uh, the avant-garde that was then already under very high pressure from um, uh, the, the rights in the Bolshevik uh, government and were already being marginalized and uh, uh, suppressed. Um, but through uh, the, the, the conflict uh, between Malevich and Tatlin in Ginkuk, um, that particular institute, of course, uh, ended earlier maybe than uh, was necessary. Tatlin then went to Kiev here uh, in order to escape uh, Malevich for always. Um, in Kiev, he started to work on this artwork, Le Tatlin. Um, there's not much known about um, Tatlin's period in Kiev, but uh, the information that we have makes it clear from various sources that uh, he already was... was uh, High, uh, intensively working on the Tatlin, uh, working with birds, uh, the research of birds, and also already with all kinds of materials that he was uh, using later on uh, to build uh, the, the, the various models of the ornithopter um, uh, that he tried to, uh, that, uh, to fabricate. Um, in 1927, um, he tries to go back to Moscow. And there must have been various reasons for him to leave Kiev um, after less than two years. Um, but of course, maybe he m must have already known that uh, Malevich also was brought over to, to Kiev to, to lecture there a uh, um, half year uh, each year. Um, he wrote to his friend Piotr Mituric uh, in mid-1927, and I quote, it is difficult for me to stay here in Kiev. It is too far away from everything. I want to go to Moscow, not to Leningrad. Malevich is there. Ask around and see what people think of me. So from this only quote that we have, it's uh, not clear, of course, if Tatlin already knew that uh, Malevich would also come to Kiev and that he um, would be traveling uh, back and forth between Leningrad and Kiev, uh, which was the case. But it is very clear, of course, that he under no circumstance whatsoever wanted to work in a city together with Malevich again. And um, it almost must have been uh, true that uh, the coming of Malevich in 1927 hastened his own... Um, um, uh, return to Moscow. The possibility of the two rivals ever to be united, a possibility that would have made Kiev instantly the center of the latest stage of the development of the avant-garde, was gone long before. Thank you very much for your attention.
And um, as it was a rather short presentation, uh, I would be happy, of course, to uh, answer questions. Uh, yeah. Очень рад буду. Есть ли времени еще есть отвечать? Какие-то вопросы? Или попозже? I have a question. Um, why do you think, in short, uh, Tatlin didn't take the place of Malevich? Just in short, what was probably his uh, theories is not, were not so strong, or he hadn't such a big team of supporters as Malevich. So, why the figure is not equal to Kazimir? I mean, why? It's a very good question. I think there are many reasons for that. Of course, at the time, they were considered equals. So, um, when you read contemporary memoirs or letters, um, other uh, artists of the time always refer to Tatin and Malevich as the leaders of the avant-garde. Uh, Rochenko, for example, uh, would say that uh, Tatin would be more important for him than uh, Malevich. Um, Lisitsky, of course, um, was on Malevich's side, but they all more or less recognized um, the equal importance of the two figures. Now, of course, later on um, in the reception, uh, the historiographical reception, um, things changed. And there are many reasons for that. At least one of them is that um, uh, an enormously large part of uh, Tatlin's work have not been preserved. Um, there are many reasons for that, but uh, he made two models of the Third International. Both have not survived. Both, I think, have been burned. One already uh, in the, in the mid-20s. Um, the other one um, uh, during the war, I think, during the blockade in, in Leningrad. Um, of the three models of the Tatlin, only one, and also in, in a um, damaged state, has survived. Of his reliefs, I think his most radical works, some very early ones, so uh, early 1914, April 1914, he started, um, which w was internationally... Uh, 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 extremely forward-looking. Um, uh, only a few have survived and in a very bad state. Most of them have not survived. So the photos that are showed of, uh, of non-existing, non-survived uh, works of art. Um, paintings have not survived. Um, Tatlin was the kind of personality. He always looked forward. He was not um, engaged with his own legacy as much as Malevich was, who was very much engaged with that. And, of course, uh, it was very deliberate that Malevich uh, left his paintings uh, in Berlin, for example, in order to, to spread them, bring them partly to Europe, um, uh, in order to, to, to preserve his legacy. Um, uh, later on, also, he was best, much better, ordered as an artist um, uh, so that his work has just been preserved much better than, than Tatlin's. There was a, a difference in personality as well. Uh, Malevich was a, a writer. He was, he was one of the great writers, at least in production, um, uh, of 20th century artists. Um, while Tatlin was a, a figure who could only speak uh, and sing, actually he was a great musician as well, um, and almost did not write long uh, theoretical texts. And of course, the preservation of Malevich's theoretical text, which is a miracle by itself also, because most of them um, were also uh, left in Berlin, uh, uh, and uh, Malevich's manuscripts were only um, uh, uh, arise in 1953, because they thought that the whole house uh, was disappeared with everything in it, and Malevich's uh, manuscripts were in the basement, which then, uh, only after uh, eight years, when all the rubble uh, had gone out, uh, appeared again. Um, these th theoretical texts, of course, have become extremely important uh, because they give art historians, people like me, uh, the possibility to, um, to go deeper into these sometimes very complex artworks. Uh, Tatlin was not a theoretician at all. Uh, he also, as at least uh, the most uh, important historian of his work uh, uh, had said several times, he was an extremely difficult personality, traumatized, um, uh, beaten by his father, uh, misused maybe, um, 
and uh, therefore had psychological problems, depressions, etc., etc., which did also not help, especially later on. Um, so there are uh, many reasons for that. Um, uh, uh, but it is something, I think, that um, uh, we should try to um, uh, make better, in a way. Yeah? So even if uh, we don't have so much work, there are now a lot of uh, uh, reproductions available uh, of the uh, reliefs, for example. They, of course, still have this quality of being something new. It's, it's not the authentic art, uh, artwork, but there was a big show of Tatlin in Basel uh, not so long ago, and uh, I think it was very well presented there. So, um, it is something that we should work on to, to bring Tatlin, I think, to the fore, who was at least in um, conceptual, uh, in his conceptual position, I think even more innovative and uh, daring and revolutionary than Malevich himself. <coughs> дуже вдячний, дуже цікавий виступ. <coughs> Я хотів запитатися, чи ви знаєте, ну, не ви, чи багато ви знаєте про Подгаєвського? Подгаєвський, Сергій Подгаєвський. Так, фактично він співавтор контрельєфів Татліна. Um, not so much, but... I did find, but I have to now to um, uh, dig deep into my memory, I have found some um, um, uh, early and very rare publications by Pat Gajewski. Um, maybe for those who, who do not know, Pat Gajewski was a, a friend of, uh, of Tatlin, who, um, when Tatlin uh, first presented his reliefs in his own studio in 1914, was there as well and recited his so-called, um, uh, and I have to dig in my uh, uh, memory again, is, uh, it was a kind of dynamo uh, declamation of his, uh, his poetry, his futurist uh, poetry. And this went together, so it was a kind of uh, a, a Gesamtkundwerk, one could say. So uh, the studio was opened between six and eight, like a performance. Uh, six and eight in the evening, and then uh, Podgajewski would recite his poetry and uh, Tatlin uh, would show his new um, uh, reliefs. So, indeed, uh, one could say that, um, that it was a, a common work of, of art. Um, later on, though, Podgajewski more or less um, uh, was lost, and I don't know exactly when he died, but... Uh, as I said recently, some very rare publications of Podgajewski have come to the fore, so this is something that uh, still we need to look into more. It, it is a very interesting subject. Може бути, ви щось більше знаєте об цьому? Подгаєвський зробив свою виставку в 1916 році в Полтаві. Там звідки Лявін. І, да, і називав він своє мистецтво сумізм. Це щось опарт такий своєрідний, коли там різні були колажі і все інше. І, і про Подгаєвську, про цю виставку написав знаменитий полтавський письменник Короленко. Короленко. Причому це озлоблена... Така була рецензія, тому що він був народник Короленко, але він через свою цю озлобленість дуже детально описав все, що там було на виставці. Розумієте? От. А помер, помер він в Полтаві в 20-х роках і видав Подгаєвський таку збірку своїх поезій під назвою «Писанка». Ну, українське розмальоване яйце. Ну, це що я можу сказати. Can I ask one more question, please? I'm very much interested in Kyiv period, Tatlin and Malevich. Could you again in short say what important probably things or interaction they did while they be, were at the same time in Kyiv? 
they, they, they were not exactly the same time in Kiev. You could say that they more or less, um, uh, well, the one after the other. Uh, so uh, I think one of the reasons why uh, Tatlin left Kiev was because Malevich was coming in. Um, uh, of course, then the, um, the director of the Kiev Art School wanted to uh, um, uh, project uh, Kiev as um, the most important center of, uh, uh, of modern art. Um, and he very well knew, of course, that for that reason he needed to, to attract these uh, great figures. Um, and, of course, there was uh, good reason for them to go to Kiev because the atmosphere in Leningrad and Moscow became ever more oppressive. Um, still, because of the, the conflict, uh, they did not want to, uh, to work together. At least Tatlin did not want to. He felt really suppressed by, by Malevich. Um, uh, and maybe it was also true that, of course, in Khutimas, uh, in Moscow, there were for Tatlin more possibilities, especially also material possibilities, to develop his uh, Le Tatlin. Uh, because he needed uh, a, a large studio for that, which he um, received at the Novojevich Monastir. So he had a very large studio over there. So there were practical reasons for Tatlin to, uh, to go back to Moscow as well. Um, uh, for the, the period that Tatin was in, uh, for the period that Malevich was in Tatin, we have uh, Tatiana's wonderful book, of course, with so many new material, uh, so many new knowledge there. Um, for Tatin's period, that, um, it is very few things are known. He worked on a few um, um, productions for children's theatre. And Alexander Parnis, who is a, a, a great uh, historian uh, of the period, wrote the most important uh, article on these um, uh, children's production. Uh, one of which it is known that um, Tatin had to make a, a enormous uh, decoration of uh, the uh, Carpathian Mountains, which played a, a role in that, uh, that particular uh, piece. And he, um, from a local uh, steel factory here, he got an enormous amount of steel and made this Carpathian Mountains from um, uh, un, um, uh, unworked uh, raw uh, steel. So that was a, a, an important uh, and obviously very innovative approach. Uh, there is a memoir related to that. One of the actors, or maybe the, the director, um, uh, said uh, something about it. Uh, that's why we know this, and it's, it's in Parnes' um, uh, article. Um, still, also, um, uh, I would really like to know if maybe on the, in the school or somewhere else in archives there is a bit more about uh, uh, Tatlin's stay here, because he stayed here almost for two years. There are some other memoirs. Uh, we know that he grew uh, birds. Uh, he had birds. He lived with birds in his apartment, which was on Dikaya Street. I don't know if that's... Huh? Provolok, yeah. Um, 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 and, he, um, uh, and he grew even fish... Am I right now? Okay, uh, frogs to, uh, to feed to the, um, to the, to the, to the birds. Um, that he w was living with. So there are all kinds of, again, wonderful uh, stories uh, of Tatlin, sometimes very uh, imaginative, uh, through all entry. It's not always very clear. For example, the, the story that he was in Egyptian snake charmer was also told to one of his uh, Kiev students, and that, of course, is a complete fabrication. So with Tatlin, it's always very difficult to um, distinguish the truth from, uh, from fantasy. Uh, but it is a very important subject that I think needs more investigation and research. Yeah, I can add a little bit that uh, there was a publication of memoirs and um, a little, uh, some articles on Tatlin's Kiev period, and it was published uh, by, by Dmitry Horbachev in Chronika 2000, the magazine that was published. Uh, published in Ukraine for several years. And there was also a little memoir in um, uh, the memoirs of Dinora Mazukevich, the uh, Ukrainian artist who was his student. And there was a short extract of her memoirs on how she visited the, <coughs> uh, this, the professor in his home, how he looked like, how he worked like, how he treated his students. So there are some information I can share. Thank you so much. It's super interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.